Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 27th, 2010, and my guest is Brian Kaplan, professor of economics at George Mason University. He blogs at EconLog, which, like Econ Talk, is part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. Brian, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me again, Russ. Now, our topic today is immigration, which is a very lively topic, and I hope Brian and I will have a lively discussion. I just want to say, in general, uh, as with all guests, not everything that Brian says that I leave unchallenged is true. And not everything that Brian says that I leave unchallenged do I agree with. So I just want to – I have a lot of respect for you out there uh, in the in the listening audience. And when guests say things that I don't agree with or that I think are wrong, sometimes I let them – I have to let them go because we only have about an hour. And I rely on your intelligence and natural inbuilt skepticism not to believe everything you hear. So uh, that will apply today, I'm sure, in, in many ways. Right, Brian? We could, but it's just not relevant. <laughs> Well, Brian's rarely wrong, I guess. So um, I learned about Brian's views on immigration from a presentation he did here at George Mason uh, in front of the George Mason uh, Economic Society, and that's available on video. So, uh, But he doesn't go much challenge there until the end when there's Q&A. So this will be a little more interactive, I hope, but you can watch the video and see Brian in action, which is very entertaining. Uh, and Brian, you start your video presentation, the, the, the speech you gave. And I want to start our conversation with a, a very interesting and provocative thought experiment. So lay it out. Sure. Uh, here's a thought experiment. Uh, suppose that moved by the plight of Haitians after the earthquake, you decide to take a trip down there to engage in some relief work. You help out for two weeks, and you're about to go home. When you go up to the desk at the airports, the person behind the counter says, I'm sorry, you're not authorized to return. I think that's very strange. So you go and talk to the United States representative, and he says, oh, that's right. You can't come back. And you say, I don't understand, why not? And the representative says, the United States government does not have to answer your questions. We don't give reasons. Okay, now, the point of this thought experiment you're is... You're stuck in yes, Haiti. Yes, you're stuck in Haiti. The point of this thought okay. experiment is, almost everyone thinks it would be wrong for the United States government to deny a citizen the right to return. Right? And my question is, why? Well, it's, it seems like it would just be a terrible thing to do to a person. Uh, like, so there's many bad things about Haiti. The poverty is terrible. Right? Even if you'd be able to find a job better than most Haitians would be able to find in Haiti, it probably would be far worse than you could find in the United States. Uh, it's a very dangerous place, a uh, very high death rate. Uh, there's uh, you know, problems of uh, isolation. Right? You're, you're in Haiti. There's some interesting things, things to do there, but you might want to see some other parts of the world too. Right? And furthermore, you might think the whole problem with being stuck in Haiti is that your family and friends are here. But I have a, slightly, a slight variant on the thought experiment where I say, all right, fine, imagine that you go down to Haiti to engage in relief work with all your friends and family, everyone you care about, and you're all denied readmission to the United States. Again, al almost everyone thinks this would be terrible, and I'd say in many ways it's actually worse than just being stuck there on your own. Certainly if I were stuck there with my family and they said, fine, well, your kids can return to the U.S. and you can't, I would say, please return my kids because I don't want them to have to grow up in Haiti. So it seems like it is a truly awful harm to inflict on a person to prevent them from moving from Haiti to the United States Yet almost everyone thinks that it's okay for the United States government to do it. And again, the point of the thought experiment is not to say that this proves that restricting immigration is wrong, but rather to say, look, there's a presumption against it. It's not the kind of thing that you can just do and say, I don't have any reasons. Why should I have to have a reason? It's the kind of thing where you do need reasons. And then in the rest of the talk, what I do is consider the main reasons the people have offered for why it, why it is okay to prevent people from moving from Haiti to the United States, even though it seems really bad to do. So let's, uh, let's lay out what those... In the talk, you were – and here we're going to talk about at least four objections. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to add one that you didn't talk about there. But uh, the four you raised – let's lay them out. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, sure. So first – And, and, and these, yeah. are the, these are to, – to make keep this on a, a relatively high level, which I, we hope to do in the comments as well. Uh, we're trying to find arguments uh, against immigration that have intellectual standing that are commonly believed. Uh, that are legitimate arguments, and Brian's going to try to mm -hmm. shoot them all down. Right. In particular, arguments that are so strong that they overcome this presumption that it's wrong to do this to someone. Right. Right. So, 
Uh, you know, the first one is um, you need immigration restrictions in order to protect Americans from poverty. Right, that immigrants, when they come in, lower American wages and are right. harmful to the people who are already here. Sure. So that's probably the, the most important one for most people. Uh, the second one that I talk about is immigration restrictions are necessary to protect the American taxpayer from abuse of the welfare state. Right, that they can come here and take advantage of things that, not to, to work, they'll just come here and live off the rest of us. Sure. Uh, the third one I talk about is you need immigration restrictions to protect American culture. We're going to have all these effects of people who don't speak English, they're going to change mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Right. And the last one is that immigrants are going to damage our politics, that they're going to take a country that is relatively free and prosperous, and by voting, they're going to turn the United States into the kind of country that they got away from. And I'm going to add two more, one of which I warned mm -hmm. Brian about, and the other one comes to mind now. Uh, one is a congestion issue, mm -hmm. that there are going to, there's going to be congestion, uh, especially in areas where we don't price stuff, and mm -hmm. they'll be able to, to uh, mm -hmm. a sudden increase in population from any source, but mm -hmm. immigration being the most the most plausible, uh, would lead to a lot of harm for people who are already here. And then the other would be crime, uh, which mm -hmm. I didn't warn you about, Brian. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say yeah, I Actually, I did discuss that a little bit. Okay, sure. so that's a that's standard true. argument. You also hear that the immigrants mm -hmm. who come here are going to we're importing criminals, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. So. Those of you out there listening, you may have other objections uh, to immigration, which you're welcome to add in the comments in a thoughtful way. But I think Brian successfully listed certainly the four most important objections that people have who I think are thoughtful and, and have legitimate concerns about open immigration is what we're talking about here. Not, not the current level. We're not going to mm -hmm. talk – we might get into it, but we're not going to talk about this whole issue of people who are already here mm -hmm. uh, illegally and what, what should be done with, with that fact – we're dealing with the fact, what should be the United States policy toward people who don't live here now and who would like to live here, of which there are a large number? Yes. So let's start with the economic, this, this, what I would call the financial argument that says mm -hmm. that if we let in immigrants, it's going to make us poorer because they're going to lower the wages of Americans who are already here. Sure. Now, just before I get started, for each of these arguments, I'm going to do two things. So first of all, I'm going to say the complaints are either wrong or overstated. And secondly, I'm going to say, suppose that we accepted the arguments completely face value, so, you know, for the sake of argument, say they're completely right. Is there any cheaper and more humane way to handle the problem than just telling people they can't come here? All right, which right, is right, second right, point. Right, which so goes, back, goes back to my starting point of, you know, there's a presumption that immigration restrictions are wrong. I think it's hard, to, it's hard when you think about the thought experiment to say that it would be okay to do this for no reason at all. And the question is, once you come up with a reason, the immigration restrictions have to be among the cheap, uh, among the cheaper and uh, the cheaper and more humane ways of doing it. If there's some, if there's some way, way of doing this, of handling the same problem that costs less and does less to injure people, then it would seem like that's the, what the route you have to go down. And I, I want to just add before I get started, I want to let people you know take a deep breath here. Uh, some of you may be thinking, oh, "It's a stupid thought experiment." Obviously, you know, if you're already a citizen, you should be allowed to come back because you've it would be so unfair because you don't have the expectation to come back. Mm -hmm. So one way to think about, I think, to make the thought experiment even more dramatic is, well, suppose you're a welfare recipient who goes to Haiti to go volunteer and help. Mm -hmm. Would you be precluded from returning if you're a welfare recipient? Mm -hmm. What about the fact that if you came back, you would affect the wages of people whose skills were like yours? So. I think let's focus on the mm -hmm. economics and, and the, the morality of this, and uh, let's see where it goes. Sure. All right. So starting with what you call the financial argument, uh, the, you know, at, at first pass, this case is, is, is slam dunk. You say, look, yeah, well, yeah, against immigration. Well, you know, that, that, that Amer you know, Americans suffer from immigration. And it says, look, you leave that in a whole bunch of other people. This is going to increase the supply of labor, which will reduce wages, QED. Okay. Which, so, which has some truth to it. Uh, is, well, I'll say it has some half-truth to it anyway. Okay. okay so uh, what can we say about this? Well, I mean, first of all, we can go to the actual empirical estimates of what the effect is. Right now, this is a contentious issue, so I found it helpful to actually go to the most anti-immigration of all of the respectable researchers in this area, uh, George Borjas, and see what he says. So I found that I was surprised. If you go to his own labor economics textbook, his estimate for the long-run effect on um, the wages of American high school dropouts of all the immigration of recent decades is that it's reduced their wages by about five percentage points, by about 5%, not 50, you know, 5.0%. So just at first glance, this seems like a very small effect to use to justify keeping a whole bunch of people from uh, coming to the United States, 
right? So just just the outset, it seems like the effect is pretty small, especially when you take a look at it, at the rest of his table and see that his estimate for the effect for the average effect on American wages is much smaller. You know, they, and actually winds up concluding there's some Americans who gain. Well, so, you think so, quite yes. a few actually. Anybody yes. who hires, right? Yes. Well, actually, I was going to go, but but particularly the wages. Well, you know, so you know, American workers who gain. So there's some American wages that are higher. He says. And remember, also, I think the other point here, I am, I'm supposed to be the devil's advocate here, but unfortunately, everyone saw I'm going to pile on, which is not supposed to be my role. But to make it clear what Brian's saying, the Borja study, this is a very particular class of Americans who, were, who would, we would think or are commonly worried about as competing with, with, with workers. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's subtle views of the immigration argument. Some people say, well, it's okay to let in, quote, the right kind, which is Borjas's position, right? He's mm -hmm. okay with letting in mm -hmm. highly educated workers mm -hmm. who supposedly contribute more than they take away, which mm -hmm. I don't agree with, but that's his claim. I mean, I think they do contribute, but I think mm -hmm. other, everybody contributes. So the, 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 this, is for, this effect of 5% isn't on every American. It's for the people who are mm -hmm. high school dropouts, right. a small portion of the U.S. population that we that we should be empathetic toward, presumably. They, they have a hard life, people who drop out of high school, but that's the effect. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, so just in terms of the direct wage effect, uh, it's quite a bit less than you think. And what's interesting is there's a lot of other researchers who have redone Boras's work with estimates that are more favorable to the effects of immigration, like, you know, like one, the, the, probably the most important one is uh, there's been other economists who said, well, all this is assuming that immigrants basically have the same skills as Americans, right? That the skills that, say, Mexicans or Haitians would have are the same as the skills that Americans would have. And in fact, they don't. Uh, immigrants immigrants uh, typically are relatively better at what are called you know, non-language non -language, non -language jobs or jobs that, or jobs that don't, info, don't require uh, you know, such uh, great, great knowledge of English. Uh, Americans, of course, have an advantage in these kinds of jobs. And the result that you get if you redo Boras's approach, but allow for this seemingly obvious fact that immigrants and, and natives have different skills, so you wind up getting not only a smaller effect on American wages, you actually wind up getting a positive effect. It's so basically Americans go and specialize in areas where, where Americans have what economists call a community advantage. Immigrants specialize in the other areas. And the result, just like with international trade generally, is that people specialize in trade and they, they all get richer. And the other technical way to think about this in terms of economics is that because those skills are different of people who are not here already, uh, that their skills mm -hmm. are complementary rather than substitutes, right. that they enhance mm -hmm. our productivity yeah, exactly. rather than, than hurting us. Right. <clears throat> so the labor market effect is not nearly as, is not nearly as clear as people think. Again, I'll, I'll say there's a, re there's a reasonable range of estimates where there's actually some very plausible work finding a positive effect on American wages, and the harshest critics come up with a very mild negative effect. So by itself, this seems woefully inadequate to saying we're going to consign large numbers of people to being stuck in countries where they earn a dollar a day. And this doesn't actually consider all the effects on Americans. Like Russ was saying, how about American employers who would seem to gain from immigration? And remember... Stockholders. Uh, yes, remember, yes, stockholders, yes. Remember, like, there are many more, you know, many more people are effectively employers or capitalists than we realize. Because anyone who owns a retirement account is one. Anyone who owns stock. And so many more of us are, at least to some extent in this group of people who are benefiting. Of course, anyone who employs personal services, if you ever plan on being elderly and maybe wanting someone to be able to help you out so you can keep living independently. Uh, and then finally, and this is one that seems particularly relevant today, the effect on real estate. Right? Immigrants <laughs> require housing, and when they come here, they, they, they raise the demand for housing, which means that real estate prices increase. And the, while there are, of course, some Americans who don't own any real estate who suffer from this, uh, however, on average, though, American real estate is generally owned by Americans. So what immigrants do is they actually wind up increasing the wealth of any American who owns real estate. Right now, when I think about people in Los Angeles complaining about how bad the real estate market is and how awful immigrants are, hmm, what would happen if we were to expel everyone who came over from Mexico in the last 20 years to uh, what would happen to, United, to uh, Los Angeles real estate? There might be a little bit more of a decline than they've already seen. In fact, yeah. it would probably be a massive decline. And this is all decline that, uh, that only all, where almost all of this actually would be suffered by Americans. So in terms of just financial effects... Uh, this is another very large and important effect that generally gets neglected when we think about what immigration restrictions do for Americans' po Americans' pocketbooks. Now, it could be, of course, and I, we're not going to have time to go into this, but it could be that that the estimates by Borjas, you've identified him as the most respectable critic of immigration. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. um, he'd certainly say it was true. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, by the way, is is an immigrant. He was born in, in Cuba, which mm -hmm. is in Cuba, I think. Yes, Cuba. Um, and... 
it could be though that he's misestimated. It mm-hmm. could be the effects are larger. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, 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 I think the right, or you might just say these are estimates only for this moderate range that we've seen. What would happen if we had a much larger, a, oh, much, right. much, much larger? Right. Effect. So right, he he's mm-hmm. evaluating the impact of a limited yes, so the amount of integration. That had, so that's right, a yes. that's a better point than mine. Yes. Yeah. So what's right. your thought on that? Well, what, you, what I say to this is, uh, you know, you know, like I said. Uh, in order for immigration restrictions to be justified, not only would you have to identify a real problem, you'd also have to show immigration restrictions were the cheapest and most humane way of, of handling the problem. And here I'd say there is obviously a cheaper and more humane way of handling whatever financial harm happens to Americans, and that is uh, to either uh, charge an entry fee, so that in order for an immigrant to come, they have to pay some, some, cash, uh, some cash amount up front, and then use that entry fee to compensate Americans who lose, Oh, well, not literally, because yes. you couldn't do that. You couldn't say. You yes. Could, well, so you could, you'd, you'd have to. That would be very imperfect. Uh, well, again, depending upon how generous it is, it could be imperfect in, in two ways, right? It could be imperfect where you wind up compensating some people who actually gain, right? And then you, they also right. get a government check. That's what I'm, one issue. Yes. So it, again, you know, like obvious places to start are you know, like you know, uh, you know, earned investment tax credit, things like that. So you know, any 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 kind of low skilled American that you think is suffering from commentary, com- earned from income, competition, not, you meant earned income, yeah, tax earned, earned income tax credit. Or something else that you could do is just charge a surtax to immigrants. So, so you can come here, but you have to pay 10 percentage points higher on your income tax. And then we're going to take that money and we'll use it to compensate Americans who've lost. And it seems like, again, both of, the, both of these are ways of addressing the concern about Americans who have lost, but which preserve the option to come here. And, and, and which again, well, now personally, I'll say I think this is pretty unfair, but I'll say it's vastly less unfair to tell someone you can come here, but you have to pay extra uh, for, rather than tell them you can't come here at all. You know, if I were stuck in Haiti, I would much rather have someone say, you can return to the year, but you have to pay 10 extra percentage points of your income tax, then you are not allowed to return for any reason. Right? Well, I would, give a different, I would give a different argument, and why don't you get your reaction to it. Um, to me, the humane policy isn't to charge an entry fee or a surtax, it's to improve... Right, more humane, more humane. Right, excuse me, the more humane. I think an even more humane policy would be to try to improve the productivity of those high school dropouts we're worried about. You know, for example, if we said um, technology, labor-saving mm-hmm. devices of various kinds, a dishwasher, a mm-hmm. washing machine, um, we could think of many, many such devices that when they came out uh, made some people's skills less in demand. Mm-hmm. Um, the internet is probably, I hope, is reducing the demand for education. Uh, so for college professors, I assume that's eventually somehow going <laughs> to eventually going to make it harder to, not in to our be a, lifetime Russ. well maybe not in our lifetime but but the idea would be if you would never argue i don't think most people would argue that because labor saving devices are hard on people who have limited skills who used to be employed as as people who wash dishes or 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 wash clothing therefore we shouldn't allow people to create new devices i think the argument would be let's encourage people to get those skills which this would by the mm-hmm. way, so one of the implications of this is that even if you think it's large effect, mm-hmm. is it would encourage people to stay at high school longer, because, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, sure. S- right, so, yeah. So actually, when I was just lecturing on this to my students today and someone said, wouldn't these subsidies encourage more people to drop out of high school? And I said, sure. Yes. I said, well, if you want to really discourage people from dropping out of high school, let in more immigrants, and yeah. then, I mean, which, which will make it better to, you know, the difference between finishing high school and not finishing larger. Uh, you know, I'm, overall, overall, I would say you know the record for at least you know government created job training programs is not, not very so good. good. Not so good. So I think the case for just giving people money rather than subsidizing job training is is probably I think it's actually probably a oh that's yeah, a winner. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, subsidize yeah, job yes. training. I'd get the government out of the schooling business right. altogether. But let's right. let's move on because I think mm-hmm. the wage argument. Um, I don't think the average person who disagrees with open immigration is worried about their own financial well-being mm-hmm. through competition. Although you could be, Brian, mm-hmm. of course. A lot of people say, uh, well, and I'll mm-hmm. throw this out so you can just have a whack at it. Easy for you to say, Brian. You have tenure. You're not really in competition with any of the immigrants we're talking about, and therefore this whole thing is – you're an unf- you're not allowed to talk about it because you're, 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 you're self-interested. Or yeah. not self-interested in the way that everyone else is. Or. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say this argument is made by some people who have either never been on a university campus or are remarkably unperceptive. So actually, there's if there's any industry in the United States that currently it does face open immigration and full competition from every worker in the world, it's academia. I mean, right now, there's a loophole that basically makes it possible for universities to hire any foreign professor from anywhere on earth. And right now, Russ and I are competing with them. Not only are we competing with them, they are in our department with us. 
if these if foreign born professors had never been allowed in, I think Russ and I would be at much more highly ranked schools and would be earning much higher wages. Actually, we are people who are suffering more than almost anyone, uh, compared. You know, like, because we are, we happen on the one hand we're in an industry where there's almost where there's effectively open borders, and yet uh, we aren't getting much of the consumption benefits from from immig- from having open immigration in all the areas where we're consumers. So, actually, university professors strangely suffer more than anyone. <laughs> Cue the violin music. It is it's a it's a poignant observation, Brian. But the point I would make with a little more seriousness is. Uh, we like having them as colleagues. Yes, uh, they make I, our I, lives richer. They presumably enhance our students' mm-hmm. knowledge because they come from a different background than we do. It's so. I just want to go on the record, Brian yes, and I. Ab- I'll speak for myself yes. and I'll let Brian yes. second it. We're in favor of open immigration across the educational spectrum. Certainly mm-hmm. at the PhD level. Certainly in medicine. Certainly, we'd love to have open immigration from every uh, level of skill. Yeah. So half my friends are professors from, who were born in other countries. So of course, I love them and. Much prefer their pre- much prefer knowing them, having those friends, to having my wages be higher. Yeah, that's but it, but it just as a matter of the financial effect on me, I am one of the biggest losers from immigration right now. It's possible for me. Poor possible. Me. Um, <laughs> I can I can. But I, can but hear I do this. have the right to talk about it. I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yes, I can hear the tears of sympathy throughout the, throughout the um, the internet. Uh, let's move on to the second one, which I think is a little more. Uh, worrisome to many people, and, I, and, I, and possibly correctly so, which is the fact that a lot of people come here and uh, are net uh, takers of tax money uh, through various uh, welfare programs or other, uh, or other things that are going on in our society. Right. So the complaint here is that immigrants are coming here to abuse the welfare state, which you know, certainly has some initial credibility because you take a look at how much money you can get for free in the United States from the government. It is considerably higher than what hardworking people in many countries on earth earn. So you take a look at this and you say, wow, I mean, it would be amazing if they wouldn't want to come here in order to collect welfare, given that they can make more money doing nothing than what they get for living by the sweat of their brow in, say, Bangladesh. Uh, however, there, there are a few, few problems with this. So first of all, uh, again, going to the more negative, negative respectable estimates of whether or not immigrants pay more in taxes than they receive in services, the most negative estimates are only, mod- are only mildly negative. And there are actually other estimates, also respectable, that get the opposite effect, saying that immigrants actually are net taxpayers, where they actually pay, receive less in services than they pay in taxes. Now, if you're incredulous on this, here's the important point to remember. A lot of what government does is what economists call non-rival. This means that the, the, the government can provide the service to a very large number of people for about the same cost as it can, as it can provide it to a very small number of people. The most obvious case is something like nuclear deterrence. We could double the population of the United States, and yet we would not need any additional nuclear weapons in order to deter an attack on our population, because like, either the attack is, deter- is deterred or it's not, roughly. Now, when you go and take a look at all the stuff the government does, there are a lot of things that are like this. Yeah, but most yeah. of the interesting ones are not. they are things like uh, direct welfare. There's things like f- uh, free education. There are things like uh, free health care. Let's see. Well, here are the two. The, the two big ones are, first of all, defense, and second of all, debt. Right, so when you increase the increase, increase po- the immigrant population, you're basically averaging that debt and the, and the interest that has to be paid on that over a larger population. Right, of course, you know, as that percentage of debt gets bigger and bigger. Now, then, you know, now, see, I think you were, let's see, I don't think you actually brought up Social Security. Now, here's the interesting thing: uh, one very common misconception about the welfare state that makes people think that immigrants are worse than they really are is that we imagine that the welfare state is mainly about helping the poor. And we take a look and we say, hey, That's there's all these poor immigrants coming here, so obviously they're going to be a net drain. It's actually just factually wrong. If you go and take a look at the numbers on the budget, while the poor are, you know, the poor do get a, a fair amount, maybe 10% of, of, of the federal budget, uh, they are a very distant runner-up against the group that actually gets the most money from the welfare state, which is the elderly. The elderly, yeah. Yes, yeah, so or the middle Social class. Security and Medicare are a much bigger deal than Medicaid and food stamps, yeah, food, food stamps and so on. Uh, housing Yes. Doctors, so. Okay. So when you and here's the interesting thing: while immigrants uh, often are poor, and especially the ones that can't that can't legally come here tend to be poor, they also tend to be young, which means they will not only be paying taxes into our system for a very long time, and on top of that, their home countries often already paid for their education. Right. So, so when you put this all together, anyway, when you put this all together, obviously I can't go and do the calculations uh, you know, uh, uh, right right here, but. Uh, basically, like, like as you raise this, as, the, as you raise the percentage of government spending up to a plausible amount that is non-rival, then you wind up getting. You know, th- then you wind up actually often concluding that immigrants are in fact net taxpayers. And here's the interesting thing: uh, for the at the federal level, they, they like they almost certainly are. 
right? Because the federal government mostly handles the payments for the elderly. At the state level, it, pro- it, it, it is much more likely and to be local. true that you know, the state and local level uh, much more likely to be true that immigrants are in that drain, which then creates the illusion that immigrants are a drain overall. Really, what's going on when California or Texas complain about immigration is that they are trying to improve the fiscal the fiscal situation of California or Texas while worsening that of the federal government. And if you go and add up all add up all the effects together, you wind up getting this one that's much more much more favorable to immigrants. And by the way. Uh, in terms of the effects, in terms of the, of the fiscal effect, uh, illegal immigrants are probably the best right? because they often will pay taxes on fake, fake social security numbers, taxes they're never going to get any benefit for because the numbers but are fake. their employers contribute. Yes, their employers contribute. And yet, not only are there benefits they're not going to get, but, uh, but, but in general, illegal immigrants are too frightened of getting caught to apply for, uh, to apply for the benefits that Americans would. So, you know, if anything, we should be really happy about the illegal immigrants who but are the, the flip clear, side of that, gain. To give the other side its due, the flip side of that is that uh, because they're illegal, a lot of their economic activity takes mm-hmm. place in underground activity mm-hmm. where maybe it's a cash business. Mm-hmm. Very little taxes are paid by anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as a result, you could argue that, well, oh. yeah, that's in their incentive because they don't want to be caught. Yeah. But yeah. as a result, taxpayers sure. are armed. Yeah, so I mean, of course, they will still wind up paying things like sales taxes and uh, and all and all indirect taxes or all, property all, taxes yes. in the sense if they own a right. home, right? Or, well, I mean, or if they're illegal, they probably aren't aren't owning home, but they're renting. So indirectly, indirectly, someone is doing that. But anyway, you know, the important thing to realize is there's a whole continuum of how illegal you are, right? So there's illegal and being totally outside of the legal sector, which uh, is, is some of what's going on. But there's also illegal in the sense of you want to you illegal work and illegal illegally work and illegal job. Which again, what a lot of illegals wind up doing, and to do that, you get a fake social security card, you pay taxes on that, and then you get nothing out of it. So, great deal for American taxpayers, strangely. The uh, example you gave, though, of the young worker who po- who's not going to be getting social security for a long time, and perhaps will never get it uh, yes. if the system uh, even, collapses. Even better for natives. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Collect their money in the meanwhile, and then never pay out any of the promises. I think what people worry about, which you're ignoring, is a situation where a person comes here. Um, doesn't speak English and takes a very low paying job, probably a job that many Americans would not be interested or eager to do, mm-hmm. and produces an, perhaps an economic benefit then for, for, for the rest of us, which is the first story we, we talked about. But then they, they get married mm-hmm. and they have kids. Mm-hmm. And their kids, they're still young, but their kids are American citizens as a result. Mm-hmm. And they are going to, schools are going to have to be built uh, to, to educate them because we have mm-hmm. a free school system. They show up at the emergency room of, of hospitals because the government mm-hmm. requires that that uh, emergency rooms turn no one away even if they don't have insurance or can't afford to pay. And as a result, those costs all get borne by non-immigrants, mm-hmm. by Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on that? No, what I say there is that's true for Americans too. The only difference is that with an immigrant, you start off 20 years, in, 20, 20 years down the line, right? So... Uh, for an American, you're paying for that person. You're paying for the person's education for the entire time. For an immigrant, you get a fully grown adult who starts working, and then you wind up just enjoy the, the, the American taxpayer just wind up getting the stream of taxes and the and the burdens that go from that person's life from 20 onwards, which is a better stream than you would get from an American. So, so part of this is an empirical question. As you sure, point sure. out, you're not we're not going to sit here and on the mm-hmm. even on the back of an envelope make a calculation. I, it's always good to point out that many immigrants hold more than one job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's a perception that most immigrants uh, come here and don't work, which is right. not true. Yes, but I, I want to a complaint that's often said side by side with they're taking our jobs and they also don't work, which is uh, yeah, for, that's, yeah, that's yes. hard to sustain that yes. that claim, uh, but. But I think, again, I, I would want to make your other argument, the more mm-hmm. humane argument, which is yeah. a, a free public school system is a bad program mm-hmm. for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for It doesn't work very well. The incentives are lousy. And if we're going to have a choice between keeping out people who are starving near subsistence and starvation mm-hmm. to worrying about the fact that they free ride on us, uh, yeah, let's get the free ride mm-hmm. out of the system for everybody. Uh, I'm totally in favor of that, Russ, although you know, usually when I'm trying to convince people to have open borders, they don't want to add in getting rid of public education on top of that. Uh, you know, one really controversial thing, controversial thing at a time is probably enough. Yeah. Um, yeah but when, you know, what, so what I say about that is, look, uh, if you are concerned about immigrants abusing the welfare state there's so, you know, or, or, you know, or, or, or the kids going and getting educated at taxpayer expense, there is um, a much cheaper and more humane solution uh, – you know, way, way of handling that complaint without changing everything else in our system, and that's to say, look, immigrants are not eligible to get these benefits, right? So you could either say they're never eligible and their kids are never never eligible in perpetuity, 
That's the, that's the strongest thing you could do. You could say you're not eligible for five years or 10 years. Right? So again, there's no reason to actually keep people out. You could just say, look, you can come here, but you, but you, and, you, and you have to pay taxes, but you can't collect benefits for a certain period of time, or you can't collect benefits ever. Would that be right? constitutional? Um, I don't see any reason why not. They're not citizens, right? There's nothing in the Constitution that says that a that a per that a non-citizen is not allowed to come and work here. So I don't think there'd be any problem. So with let's that. let's let's get practical okay. here for a minute, which is mm -hmm. um, always challenging. Uh, I think in your talk you mentioned that there might be a billion people in the world mm -hmm. who earn a dollar a day or less. We mm -hmm. interviewed Paul Collier here on his book, mm -hmm. The Bottom Billion, and that's a good rough yes. e estimate. So there's a billion people who would like to be here, perhaps, mm -hmm. as you point out. Uh, as, as common sense suggests, not all billion want to come here tomorrow. Right. They don't speak mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. they, they do mm -hmm. have friends. Mm -hmm. they, they may like where they live. Mm -hmm. Most people do. They're mm -hmm. attached to it, and it's right. changes But if it were easy to move, then many people might move as groups. Yes, they would. And, and there would be – but I think we'd agree that mm -hmm. it might not be a billion, but be a mm -hmm. big number. Mm -hmm. So they come here, uh, let's say, and um, – I want, I want to talk about your humane solution. We're going to give them a five-year moratorium. So they come here. They can't find a job. Uh, they go to apply for food stamps and other forms of, mm -hmm. of public assistance, and mm -hmm. they're told, oh, you're an immigrant. You can't have that for five mm -hmm. years. So what do we do now? Do we ship them back? Do we march them to the border? Do we require rely on, public, on private charity to help them? How are we going to enforce this more humane solution? Right. So probably the most obvious way of doing it, which again is, is not what I favor so much as what I will offer to people to change their minds, uh, to convince them that what we have is much worse, is to say you can't come until you've got a job lined up. Right. So, so if you're worried about people showing up and then not having a job, then you say you know, before you can come here, you have to have an, you have to have a job lined up. So that's, that seems, I mean, again, I mean, that actually already is to some degree probably a part of current immigration law, but just to, just to imagine expanding that to, uh, well, to a great extent. I, I would suggest it's not really part of if we think about the actual system we have, which includes legal and illegal. Yes, sure. So, you know, my understanding... A, a part, not the only thing going on. Having spoken to a contractor in confidence about the world he lives in, uh, his workers come across the border, they pay a fee mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, I forget the... Coyote? The, yeah, a coyote, who, who is, which is the name of somebody who is really good at fooling the border guards. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's a very interesting world, by the way. There's a lot of specialization in, in that world, which is fascinating in and of itself. But they come here, and they, and they come here to go – they expect to go work for him or people like him. They have a network of people who've already come here. They don't have a job lined up, but they have mm -hmm. the expectation of a job, mm -hmm. which turns out to be true. And in fact, in those situations, if it doesn't turn out to be true, they go back uh, typically because they don't particularly want to live here. They're going to be sending money back home. They're not coming here mm -hmm. to establish themselves necessarily. But again, I, your requirement. First of all, if it's re, if it, I don't know how you'd actually verify that. I mean, how would you how would you prove that you have a job lined up? That'd be number one. Number two, mm -hmm. uh, it would that would certainly lead to all kinds of lying and and deception. Mm -hmm. And uh, number three, if it doesn't, then maybe it just keeps people out through this mm -hmm. requirement. I don't know how it's going to. Well, gonna, well you, know, you know, I say you know, cheaper, doesn't appeal cheaper, to me. Cheaper and more humane. And so, uh, I mean, again, you know, so. You know, my first choice would be to, to say, yeah, you are allowed, you are free to come, and we'll see what happens. Uh, but again, like I, I would rather go and convince people to to switch to something that is less awful than what we have than simply hold out for for the first best option. Again, in terms of how would you actually verify this, I don't think it's that hard as long as you have sufficiently high fines for uh, for, for fraud. Right? If you if you go if you for example if an employer who goes and signs something saying that you are you are my worker if he comes here and that uh, you know if you know, if you can show that he can, he's engaged in fraud there you can either. But if he gets time. fired, if he gets yes. fired after yeah. two weeks, yeah. what do you get to do with him? Uh, well, yeah. right. I mean, of course, right now there are many guest worker programs where that it already exists, where you do have to go home or find another job within a certain time period, which again is not what I favor. But I say it's a lot better than what we have, where you are not allowed in regardless. But you know, the main thing for the billion person problem is uh, right now you know, within the United States we already have uh, open borders between the fifty United States. And you might think that some states would have completely emptied out and others would be totally full right now. You know, take a look. You know, why would anyone keep living in Kansas when you can live in New York City? Isn't New York City so much more interesting than Kansas? Of course, there's some people who say, no, I don't like it. I, mean, I, I think it's fair bet that there are a lot more people in Kansas who think New York City is more interesting than Kansas than people in New York City who think that Kansas is more interesting than New York. Well, they right? do have different populations. Yes, they do have different populations. Now, here's the thing. 
Uh, there are uh, some very simple market forces that are at work right now that allow us to have free mobility within the United States without chaos. And the, uh, and the market forces are, first of all, rents and real estate prices adjust. So if you want to live in Manhattan, you have to pay an arm and a leg. And if you want to live in Kansas, it's almost free. Okay, so that's one thing is there's plenty of people in Kansas who don't move because it's so expensive. And they don't value yes. the amenities enough, the New York yes. Harbors, or right. they view them not as amenities. Right. And, and secondly, uh, you know, so the, you know, interesting, work on, uh, interesting work on wages, but the punchline of this is that in areas where people really want to live, wages are lower relative to their cost of living than they'd otherwise be. Yep. Okay, so I mean, you may think that New York has, has unusually high wages. They're high money wages, but when you adjust for cost of living, New Yorkers actually earn less than people who are comparable. So in uh, one of Tim Harford's books, he, he goes over all the evidence of this. So it's an you know, excellent book. I uh, can't remember whether it's yeah. uh, whether, whether it's the we'll, under, under, we'll undercover, under, undercover economists or the logic of life. So you, you know, basically you, you, you do have market forces of, wa- of rents and wages adjusting. And this is, this is the market force that would also keep a billion people from showing up right away, which is that you know, when a very large increase in population were to happen, especially when they're all low skilled or almost all low skilled, there's going to be a very large increase in rents and a very large decline in wages for low skilled workers. And those two things together are a reason, not, are a reason to, to wait, at least to wait and, until the logistics oh, settle yeah, themselves. Oh, yeah, ration some of the flow, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I mean, you probably know a bit more than I do about the, you know, the original waves of Soviet immigrants going to Israel. But you know, basically, you do have an initial problem where the, with, with, with logistics and you know, too, too many, you know, a lot of people showing up, showing up at once. Uh, 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 what we call it, you know, it's a yes. peak load problem. Yes, peak load is problem, the, is the but... Jargon. Uh, word gets back to Russia that things in Israel aren't as good as they originally heard, and people wait, and you know, eventually, uh, event, it just it slows it down. It takes a few more years, but uh, you know, Soviet, but you know, Russia empties, and Israel gets its, gets, gets its Jews. So, going to the United States history, which we haven't talked about, mm-hmm. there were periods in the United States where there was close to open immigration. That's correct. Yes, uh, it's fascinating. I've done a little reading of the time, not very much, but all the issues that we talk about, people worried about then also. Sure, sure. Uh, in particular, the, the culture one, which we should let's turn to next, mm-hmm. which was uh, in the case actually of St. Louis, where I used to live, uh, St. Louis has a lot of German immigrants, and they, uh, in the late 19th century, I think, they established their own schools that were taught in German, and a lot of people said uh, and wrote about that these people are never going to assimilate, they're going to ruin our country because they're living in their own world, they speak their own language, they're not really Americans. That were in that case at least turned out to be false. Those people did assimilate. Mm-hmm. Uh, many of them brewed beer, uh, which was uh, good f- for beer drinkers everywhere. Um, so uh, let's talk about the culture issue. What's the standard mm-hmm. argument there? All right. So the one that makes the most sense to the most people is just immigrants are not learning English. Yep. Right? And this this is the one that bo- that probably bothers bothers people the most. Uh, they're you know they're they're looking into this. I found so you know even uh, even Huntington, who's one of the people who is most concerned so Samuel about yeah, Huntington. Yes, yeah one of the people who's most concerned about the effects of immigrants on culture, will admit that ninety percent of Mexican of second generation Mexican immigrants speak fluent English. The kids. Yes. So, so second generation ninety percent of Mexican immigrants speak fluent uh, of second generation Mexican immigrants speak fluent English, and then after saying this, then he tries to argue it's still a big problem. But to me, say, look, it's a short-run problem. Yes, you know, and yes, I don't even see what the problem is. I've never understood this argument. Is is it worried that if you're going down the street and you need to, uh, you need? It turns out there's a fire. You're about to drive into a fire or a dangerous situation, and the immigrant's yelling at you in his native language. So he can't warn you. So you get, you know, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, well, I think may, maybe the argument is your children will live under Spanish. It's like Nikita Khrushchev saying your children will live under communism. Yeah. People are worried about, you know, their descendants are no longer going to speak English. It's going to be a totally different culture. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, market forces give people a strong incentive to learn the language of the country that they're in, and it doesn't. You know, so language by itself just doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Even for the case of Spanish, where where the case is most credible, there's a very large subculture where you never need to learn English for any other language. Uh, then it's very hard to make the case at all. Uh, and then you know, th- now then people will often go and say, no, no, it's not just learning English. It's this broader cultural thing uh, that that you're not taking into account. Uh, let's see. So I think we're going to talk about politics separately. So yeah, so, and yeah, before so, you do that, mm-hmm. let, let's just. Um, you know, st- sticking with with the with the language issue, I think part of the reason I think people are concerned is that the state, the government requires certain bilingual adjustments, mm-hmm. which I've never understood the, the argument mm-hmm. for that. But to require to you know to mm-hmm. <laughs> to force school districts to provide second language mm-hmm. instruction seems to me to be very bizarre. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why that's in place and what's the rationale for it. But I think that's one of the reasons that people do resent uh, mm-hmm. or worry about the a second language issue. Sure. I mean, I mean, I'll agree that's a bad idea, and I don't think it's very good for kids to be 
spending a lot of time learning, you know, not learning a language that they really need to learn to succeed in adult society, right? But I still say that for all all the bilingual problems that have, that have gone on in this country, still you've got raw fact: ninety percent of second generation Mexican immigrants why, uh, you know, speak fluent English. So, like, whatever whatever damage you think bilingualism is doing in the schools hasn't been enough to hold back more than ten percent from learning fluent English. So. While I think it's a bad idea, I don't think it's really done that much harm. I guess the next argument would be the one you raised earlier, which would be if we allowed something closer to open borders, mm-hmm. may- maybe it wouldn't be 90 percent. There'd be economies mm-hmm. of scale and, and the production of a, subcla- a subculture mm-hmm. that was a- all in Spanish. Although there would also be so many new languages coming. And what would be the lingua franca? It would be English. Yeah. yeah the, French, you know, the, the, uh, the French language would be English. Yes. Uh, as, as, Lingua as franca out. is a strange phrase. Right? I mean, it's all, which, of course, English already is all over the world. Yeah. Right? And to think that it wouldn't be here when you, ha- when you have people from countries all over the world rubbing shoulders together, obviously English would be the focal point. So, uh, and, and so I wouldn't, wouldn't, think, wouldn't see that as a problem. And then sort of for, you know, for broader culture, things like you know, people are naming their kids the wrong names or they, are, they, they don't appreciate baseball. So and, uh, I, I, I would say that, you know, if this argument were made, made in France, I would at least kind of understand what they're talking about, how we need to preserve French culture. But culture seems to be so low down on Americans' priorities that <laughs> it's odd to me, like, like, like the immigrants are not going to know about Friends or they're like, they're not going to appreciate Seinfeld or, you know, I, I will say I am, at some point I'm just baffled <laughs> as to what kind of culture that Americans do know that immigrants don't know. I mean, it's not like most, Ameri- most Americans know enough about European culture to name three operas of Wagner off, off the top of their head. So as to what the immigrants are even, what it is the immigrants are supposed to know that they don't. I, I, I guess there be, might be fewer productions of Shakespeare, I guess yes. would be the worry, but there aren't very many. Yeah, because, America, because the typical American loves Shakespeare, Shakespeare sees loves several, it, yeah. several, I mean, the, the histories, the comedies, <laughs> the tragedies, you know, one of each really per season <laughs> for an American to feel normal. Uh, but anyway, what I say about this at the end is, look, let's take the complaint at face value and see if there's a cheaper and more humane way of dealing with the culture problem than just telling people they can't come here. I say, look, this is really simple. How about if you're worried about them speaking English, we require English fluency to come into the country. Give a test of English fluency. If you pass it, you can come in. That would seem to almost completely answer this, other than all right, there could be some corruption. Sorry, all right, so there's always some corruption, but still, it doesn't seem like that big of a problem. And then if it's in no, it's not just English, it's broader culture. Fine, we'll give a test of cultural literacy. Well, so that's not the professor, issue. Professor, professor a, Hirsch can, give, yeah, get, can design the cultural literacy <laughs> test to know what American culture is supposed to be. I, I, no, but I think that's not the issue. I think the issue is, and I, I happen to be on the, as in many of these cases, I don't, not only do I not accept the complaint, but I actually think that, that, the, that it's a benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the worry is there'd be uh, too much Mexican food, too much mm-hmm. whatever Mexican music, I happen to like both, but other people don't. So the worry would be that our culture would be would be changed, not just that they speak a foreign language, but that mm-hmm. the texture of, of cultural life, even even the even mm-hmm. the uh, the TV shows. You know, you're making fun mm-hmm. of Seinfeld's being a low is lowbrow culture, but yeah, no, I like Seinfeld very much. No, I know you do, yes, and you, Brian. Yes. I just want to say for the record, Brian's a very mm-hmm. lowbrow guy. I'm proud of it. Uh, not quite. But well, I'm, I'm, I appreciate <laughs> all forms of culture from okay. Wagner. To South Park. Yeah, uh, graphic novels to uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. But I think the, the worry, and again, I see it as a plus, is that somehow the mix, of the American stew, the mix would be mm-hmm. dominated by certain cultures. And my view is it's a market process. Mm-hmm. Um, the yes, French, yeah. the Canadians do pr- protect their domestic movie industries and other forms of so-called culture um, from foreign influence, and I view that as a strange idea, and mainly a, just a form of special interest rent seeking. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think people do worry about this uh, mm-hmm. in America. And my view is, what, what, you know, it's like saying, what's the most popular American food? Is it Chinese food or sushi? It's, it's one, or maybe it's pizza. Uh, but all three of them are heavily influenced, of course, by immigration and foreigners. Um, sure. I mean, that reminds me. So actually, you know, so in my talk, I just you know, began with this. Simple empirical observation that, like, what are the states in the United States that we think of as having a, a really good culture? Let's see, generally people put Kansas, New, you know, New, New York, and California come to the top. I have to say, our yes. Kansas listeners, we have, I'm sure yes. Brian has nothing against Kansas. I have many I, I, friends not. in Kansas, yes. and I know, I, I know they're listening, my Kansas friends, and and it's a fine place. Let's just for the record, right. with lots of culture. Yes. But, but it's less but, dynamic. Yes, it's, it's not, less not as much diverse. as, it's not less as, much as, as New York or California. And so, if you, I mean, basically, what I, what I realize if you go and take a look at the places where, you, where they have the most culture in the United States, they are clearly places that have very high foreign-born percentage of their population. And if you go and take a look at the states that have the lowest 
foreign-born percentage of their population. There's at least ones where almost no one would claim that they are exceptional in culture, so places yeah. like the Dakotas. Yeah. Right. So now you may say, well, this isn't really causal. California and New York would have great culture even if there were no immigrants. So here I'll say, well, it's a little hard to say, except, for the, except for the case of food, where, it's, where it, it's absolutely clear that it is the immigrants who cause it. And I'd add, isn't food the only kind of culture that Americans really genuinely appreciate a lot? It's one of them. Yeah, anyway. I think it's, it's probably at the top. So, you know, like, do you really want to eat the, the, the local fare of the Dakotas? I mean, possibly, I mean, I don't, I don't not, I'm not sure that I've ever eaten it, but I suspect <laughs> I wouldn't like it as much as what is available in a 10 minute drive for me in Fairfax because I'm in a high, high immigrant area. Well, let's move on to politics. Mm -hmm. What's the worry there? Right. So this is actually an argument that has the most appeal to libertarians and probably conservatives as well. And the story here is, look, you know, we love you immigrants. You're wonderful people. The, you know, like, you know, all these other part, all, maybe all these other complaints are exaggerated against you, but there's one problem with you. And that is you come from countries that aren't free. And, and the fact that you come from these countries probably means that you don't like freedom. And if you come here and start voting, you're going to turn our politics into your politics, and you're going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Or you're poor, and you're going to vote for more redistribution. Yes, an another, another variant of this. Right? Yes, so the claim, you, know, you come here, you're poor, you're going to vote for the welfare state, you're going to make it bigger, and you're going to, again, ruin our country. Okay, so a few things you can say about this. Uh, but let's see. So first, first of all, again... Uh, this, this is a case where there seems to be a cheaper and more humane alternative to not letting people in, and that is just to say you can come here as a guest worker, but you can't vote. Okay, so that were, if that were all the complaint were, then it seems like that would, that would be the right, the, the, right, the right place to go. Uh, secondly, you know, like, you know, the, you know, there is the question of like, how hell-bent are immigrants on turning the United States into Mexico or Congo? Again, it may be that, that their opinions are moderately less pro-freedom than, than those of people, people who grew up here. Right? But it seems unlikely that this is that big of a deal for them. Right? So, the, and here we, we can actually count on what psychologists call status quo bias, which just says that people tend to think that whatever is is okay, which is, of course, one of the reasons why it's so hard to change people's minds on immigration. Right? But it says that you know, when immigrants come here, you know, the fact that there are totally different politics here than what they grew up with, uh, the reaction is probably not going to be we must now go and radically change things in order to make things like they were at home. Rather, it's going to be that's how things are here. Here seems to be okay. That's good enough for me. All right. So I think this does at least greatly tone it down. Uh, you know, I would also say if you take a look at recent American politics, it's not totally clear how in love with liberty the uh, typical American voter is yeah, anyway. I'd say that's kind of right. But uh, you know, you know, but on you know, on the welfare state point specifically, here there's actually some very good evidence that immigrants actually you know, do something very good for liberty or, or, or do something that, is, that hurts the welfare state. Namely, if you take a look at countries that have the most generous welfare states, they generally are ones that are ethnically homogeneous. They're yes. ones where it's just a whole bunch of people who see themselves as being one identical people with one soul in common. Right? So, again, you know, Scandinavia has been, Scandinavia's been, cha well, Scandinavia's been changing recent years, but a very good story about why they traditionally have had such a large welfare state is everyone in Denmark sees we're all Danes here. Right. And if everyone is all Danes here, first of all, you don't mind paying for the welfare state that much because you're taking care of your own. And second of all, you're much less, since you trust your own kind, you're much less likely to feel like they're ripping you off. Well, do you think Europe, which has allowed more immigration lately, has become more heterogeneous? I think, I, I think I, it's, Do you think their welfare state's gotten smaller? I, th I think that... I th let me... I'll at least take the Austrian position and say that it would, that it is smaller than it otherwise would have been. <laughs> I always say, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, there's 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 many, th many things going on. So you know, Scandinavia is is curtailing the welfare state, and it, and like much of the opposition to the welfare state comes down to their immigrants here who are collecting benefits. And unlike a Dane or a Swede who would never dream of taking money from the government unless he actually needed it, an Iraqi immigrant or a Somali immigrant very well might. Right. So and this, this is a well-established pattern around the world that, in general, the more ethnically homogeneous a country is, the bigger welfare state, it tends to have other things being equal, which is a standard explanation for why the American welfare state is small compared to Europe's, is that we are a nation of immigrants, and you know, we are a nation of immigrants, and of course we also have, you know, even among populations we don't think of as immigrants, like blacks, we, you know, there, there are different groups who are seen as being different groups. Right. Now, many people you know, sort of point figures this and say, you know, the real reason Americans don't have this welfare state is because of prejudice. Right, and Could there's, there's something to that actually, but in terms of the effect on our politics, I actually say that this, you know, this is a good effect. Right, you know, if you are a libertarian or conservative, and you think the welfare state tends to be too big, there is something you can do in order to help and in order to undermine undermine support for it is to let in more immigrants so that natives feel like they're getting ripped off and don't like it anymore. <laughs> 
Now you say, well, listen, I'm a little circular yes, about yes, that, Brian. I'm having a little trouble yes. with this yeah, as well, a selling, yeah, as a marketing yes, strategy. Well, it's, a mar- it's true as to whether it actually works as a marketing strategy, a different story. <laughs> but you know, basically the point is, look, even if the immigrants personally are more in favor of the welfare state, immigration reduces native support for the welfare state. Yeah. And the net effect at least is unclear. And empirically, it seems to be the net effect is negative. Right. Again, of course, if you, you know, if you're just concerned about, you know, like if you just want Americans to take care of Americans, this doesn't make sense. But if you just don't like the welfare state, and this is you know, like, like, you know, this is a great way to get rid of it. Or, you know, just imagine that uh, there were there were a constitutional rule saying that everyone on Earth is eligible, for, like whether or not they live here, everyone on Earth is eligible for any American welfare state program. What do you think Americans would do to the welfare state if they were under this constraint? Make it smaller. Yeah, I think you know, I think they might even get rid of it. They could, yes. Right? You know, yeah. if every single person on Earth were eligible to get a free public education at American taxpayer expense. Or a voucher think, for the equivalent. Yes. Yeah. I mean I think American Americans might say, you know what? <laughs> Maybe a private market in education yeah. is okay. So okay. That's, yeah. that's an interesting point. Yeah. I want to come back to the um, I think again, I think you cheat a little bit on your argument about uh, the the role of immigrants who are here, and you're ignoring the effects on children uh, and their children, which I think is one of the issues that people are very concerned about. And the point I would raise in your support, though, which which I think is which is important, is that I think a lot of people, just to make it simple, I think a lot of people have a fear of immigrants because they're poor. Uh, of course, there are people like um, Sergey Brin, who founded mm-hmm. Google. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, something like about half the immigrants who are here are, you know, earn, earn, earn above the median income because it's easy for, for well, you know, you know, highly skilled immigrants find it easier to get here legally. Yep. Um, head of Intel, the founder of Intel, Grove, uh, Mr. Grove, is uh, an immigrant. There, there are a lot of great immigrants in the high-tech mm-hmm. world, and we understand that engineering skills are often very uh, highly uh, prized here and less valued elsewhere, and so many highly skilled people have come. But I think what people really worry about is people who would immigrate – or, quote, not like them, uh, not just not like them in terms of uh, ethnic origin or, or national origin, but not like them in terms of skills. And so what I think a lot of people are about are poor people coming. And this worry that they would be on welfare, I think I think it could be true. I, I agree your point about more humane. But I think the point I would add is that a lot of people come here not to get on the welfare system. We, we know that immig- many, many immigrants work very hard, as, as I just mm-hmm. mentioned earlier. Many of them work multiple jobs. Sure. Look at any any, any hard work being done in Los Angeles. It's almost always being done and by someone from Latin America. It's true here, too. Uh, painting, homework, home construction. Not that there is much, unfortunately, right now, but lots of work being done by immigrants. Um, but they come here for their kids. And I just it's such an important point to make, given the debates that we have in America now about inequality and about opportunity, whether the ladder of opportunity is broken. The studies that I've seen, and maybe I haven't seen all the studies, but the studies I've seen are the best ones, but the studies I've seen show not just that second generation immigrants learn English, but they thrive. They Mm -hmm. thrive financially relative to their parents. And very soon, of course, they're not immigrants anymore. They're Americans like Mm -hmm. you and I, whose ancestors moved here at some point in the distant past. And how well they do in our society is is not a function of what country they were born in. It's a function of how much education they have, how hard they work, luck, of course, also. But education works. It's very powerful. And immigrants who come here uneducated, who can't speak English, give birth to children, who end up speaking English, go to college, graduate from high school, go to college or don't, but who do better than their parents and mm-hmm. eventually do as well or better than, than Native Americans. And to suggest that that somehow uh, that their parents will, will sabotage the political process to keep their kids poor, which is essentially what is the argument, is it to me it shows nothing, no knowledge of, of, of human nature and what, why these people come. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean – I actually would probably be a little bit less sanguine than you, or I'd say, look, I mean, I think it, it is true that you know even second generation Hispanics uh, you know earn earn below the median earn below the median American income, so and and have below the median American educational attainment and so on. So I don't think that you really need to push this point that strongly. I, I mean, it is fair to say they have a much better life than they would have had at home, and they contribute, right? Yeah. right? You know, they you know, they 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 they, they pull their, they they pull their own weight and more, and that's enough. And you know to go you know this point to go and, and make a big deal about, you know, but do they actually wind up getting to educational parity with native born Americans or, you know, people whose parents were native born Americans, you know, in a way it's, you know, the, 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 it's really, really not, really not even what we're talking about. So, so what if they don't? Yeah. Well, I agree with that too, but I, I, I mentioned it, the inequality point because I, I find it fascinating that people, this is a digression, uh, the people who worry about inequality, 
uh, ignore the fact that that tens of thousands of people legally and illegally come here to be at the very low end of mm -hmm. the of the income distribution mm -hmm. because they do not think that everyone here is stuck with where they're at and they mm -hmm. think that their kids and correctly mm -hmm. their kids will do better than they are than they're doing yeah, I mean, I think on some level, a lot of the hostility to immigration is just that every immigrant is a reproach to every native-born American who didn't do more with his life. Well, it's, I don't know about uh, it's, that. it's a little bit hard, but it's true. I mean, but to go and say, look, you know, someone came here not speaking English. They, well, worked, their way up, they worked their way up from the bottom, and now look at them. You were born here. You speak English as, you know, like English as your native language. You had, a, uh, you had an education paid for by American taxpayers for free. And, the, and these immigrants have done as well as you. Like, well, how do you explain that? What's your, why exactly is it that we should be more, so worried about you when there are people like this in the world who have done so well with so little? I think, I, I think it, again, it's the kind of question that it, I, I mean, while it is rude to raise, I think it is also fair. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I've always, it, going back to our original conversation, original point about the, the Borja study and the, the fact that, mm -hmm. that there's a penalty paid by high school um, dropouts mm -hmm. if immigrants come, so it's so you've got these millions of people mm -hmm. who are desperately trying to have a better life, and we're going to prevent that because there are people here who were given those opportunities and didn't mm -hmm. take advantage of them and are going to be punished by 5%. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a hard argument to make. Let's turn to one we haven't talked about, uh, which is crime. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, I think, uh, argue that immigrants have a much higher crime rate mm -hmm. than Native Americans. Um, there is a lot of violence right now on the Texas Mexican border related to the drug trade. I, I remember a story hearing recent, recently that that the Arizona issues that are going on right now about the policing of the Arizona border and the fight between the feds and the state of Arizona, that, that there are many people who are just, they're afraid, they're scared. They see a lot of violence going on. They're, uh, you know, they might live on a ranch in the middle of nowhere and they hear about people getting shot and killed and they're scared. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, obviously, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether you've talked with anyone else on your podcast about what psychologists call availability bias. No. But it's basically this tendency for rare, memorable examples to stick yeah. in people's minds True. and make them overestimate the chances that such a thing will happen. You know, like a lot of what's going on is that whenever an immigrant commits a crime, people remember that it's an immigrant and, and they hold it against immigrants in general. Whereas when an American commits an equally heinous crime, they don't think, well, Americans are violent. Americans are criminally inclined. Or we need to, yes. we need to export our criminals outside yes. the border to keep right. them from hurting uh, not, us. Right. Or especially, you know, and again, when you say a young male commits a crime, we rarely think young males are terrible. We need to go. And you know, young males generally Which do, they genuine, do. Genuinely they do have more violent than, than crime, right? Than, yeah. so again, this is something where it's hard to... Go and, set, go and settle this here, but again, from what I from what I understand of the mainstream academic literature on crime rates of immigrants, the raw fact is that immigrants have a lower crime rate than native-born Americans, right, by a considerable amount. So I blogged on this before. Uh, let's see, maybe, maybe in the, like the we'll, podcast you can we'll go, you know, go, go, and, go, and, go and link to it. Yeah, we will. But you know, this this is the raw fact. Again, this there's there may be certain areas of the country where this is not true. Right. Right. So. That right. Also, 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 we're saying, but again, the you know, the point is, this is not a problem with immigrants in general. Right and and in, and in particular, here's this writing thing. If it were a question of crime, then there's still a lot of immigrants you wouldn't worry about. Like you wouldn't worry about you would be barely worried about women. Women have very low violent crime rates in any country I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't worry about older immigrants. Right. Right. Okay. So because you know, like well, like, very few men in their 30s and older commit violent crime. Right. A lot of it seems to be based on testosterone. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, so the, 16 so, to so, 25, yes. you can't come in. But... Yes. Yeah. So again, you know, the cheaper, more humane thing is, like, you know, we're worried about crime. We are going to keep out the ones that we profile as being very criminally inclined and let and let in the rest. Right. And you know, that's again, that that seems uh, awfully harsh. And you know, like you know, if, the idea that we would go and deport. Oh, like, like, you deport healthy young men between the ages of 16 and 25 if they were born in this country seems pretty crazy to us. Right? So, but but again, if you know, I would be better to let better to let in a lot than you know better to, better to let in a lot than to let in none based upon the crimes of a small minority. Um, let's talk about the congestion issue, mm -hmm. which I mm -hmm. think is uh, an interesting issue, and I, I actually I want to get at it by taking an example I have trouble thinking about. So I'll let you think about it for me. Mm -hmm. You you started you made the I think important point that's often forgotten, uh, and it, this comes up, of course, not only with immigration, but also with trade issues. We have open borders between uh, California, Texas, uh, New York, and Vermont, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you don't see uh, all the wages driven. Mississippi doesn't get all the jobs. The right. fact that Mississippi has the lowest wages, or used to, mm -hmm. I don't know if they still do, but mm -hmm. they don't get all the jobs, and mm -hmm. similarly, not everybody moves to California, and their mm -hmm. answer is there's all kinds of reasons, some, most of mm -hmm. which the most 
the right answer is what you talked about earlier, that there are these countervailing market forces that limit mm -hmm. that. So let's take a – but one of the problems with those countervailing market forces is they don't work very effectively in, in uh, places – in areas where we've uh, mandated through public policy uh, zero prices. Or they work in funny, not so healthy ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so the example I'm thinking about is uh, the city of Portland, Oregon. Now, I haven't been to Portland for a long time, but it's a very – people who live there like it a lot. Uh, it's a very uh, – considered a very pleasant city. And it appears that they've put in place a lot of public policies to make it hard for there to be new construction, new development, mm -hmm, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they call it uh, you know, smart growth is the, is the mm -hmm. term for it. But you could think of it as simply a fence. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, basically, they mm -hmm. say, we like our life here. We have a good life. This, the air is clean. Uh, the parks aren't crowded. The roads aren't too congested. And we're going to put up barriers to immigrants, in this case, mm -hmm. within America, because they're ruining. They're going to ruin our life. So we're going to do that. And mm -hmm. what's wrong? Do you think that's a good idea, bad idea? Uh, and if how does it affect your feelings about international integration? Immigration. Right. So I think it's a bad idea, and I would say so even if they're right. Uh, but wait a minute. You yeah, say what? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think when you. Uh, yeah. I think what do you mean, they, even, yes, if they're, I, what do you mean I, even if they're right? Yes. So even even if the inhabitants of Portland are right that they're maintaining their quality of life by making it impossible for other or very difficult or costly for other people to move there, say, look, you are maintaining your quality of life, but I think what you're doing is wrong, uh, you know, morally wrong. Right. Uh, but uh, knowing how far you usually get with arguments like that, I would also say something else, which is, look. You are. It is true that that uh, when more people move to your area, there are some congestion costs. There's some things that become less convenient. You're, you get a bit more road congestion. You get more, a bit more park congestion. One solution to this, of course, as Russ and I and any and any economist in the world knows, is to stop giving stuff away for free to everyone who wants it, right? So, chart put you know put tolls on the roads, and um, and and charge you know charge a user fee to use the park and so on, right? But we'll even, come back but, to that yes, another yes, time. Yes. I actually don't think mm -hmm. that's such an ideal solution, unfortunately. I know right. it's commonly believed that's sort of an obvious mm -hmm. improvement. To me, it's a little more difficult, but right. go ahead and keep right. going. But anyway, you know, even putting that aside, uh, while, there are, while there are these congestion costs, there's also, there's also negative congestion benefits, which, which, are, which are very worth, worth considering. So you, know, you, go, you go to New York, which, is, which uh, at least historically, uh, it's clearly been a lot easier to build up New York than Portland because there's so much more that's happened there. Right now, you take a look at, uh, you know, at what's going on in New York, and pretty much you know, anything you want to do can be done in New York. Right? There's, you know, the, because the population is so large, there's so many different kinds of people there. Right. Like almost you know, anything that you, any job you want to do, anything you want to consume, any interest that you have, you can do it in New York. Right now, a lot, you know, now, here's the thing, is while there are these congestion, uh, congestion costs, there's also benefits to this congestion. Right? Oh, economists would also call it increasing returns, returns to scale, say, or, 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 or agglomeration economies, another term for it. It basically says, look, when you move to an area, you are ignoring not just the cost that you inflict on others in terms of uh, raising congestion, so you're also ignoring the benefits that you give them in terms of creating a thicker market for the things that they enjoy doing. Right? So when you go and move to, to, uh, move to New York, uh, you don't consider, I'm going to make it easier for people to find a chess partner. Right, or maybe maybe you want you know to, to pick a better and rarer hobby. You know, someone who's going to play mutants and masterminds uh, with me, right? So, yes, you know, role playing game that I that I play with my kids, All right? So, uh, you know, this, you know, this may seem like a trivial point, but here's the thing: you know, like uh, every time someone has said, like, you know, New York City would be great if not for all the people. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know what they if have they in didn't mind. have all yeah. the people, it wouldn't be great anymore because the choices that people value would be greatly constricted. It's true. You could walk. You could drive more yes. quickly you from could drive more quickly, from the but Lower East Side to the Upper West yes, Side, but, but many of those you wouldn't business, want to. Yes, because many, of be businesses would, many of the businesses would close. Many of the people that you want to do activities with wouldn't be there anymore, right? And so, you know, even even when you're stuck in a world where you can't charge people for things, it's always worth remembering that aside these, you know, next to the congestion economies, we should also remember these agglomeration economies. And here's the thing. Uh, economics actually has a very clear prediction about what the effect of population will be if the, if the congestion if the congestion problem is worse than this agglomeration benefit, and that is to say that when more people move in, rent should fall. Rent should fall because when more people move pleasant. in, it becomes a less nice place to live. Right. You know, and certainly we can imagine a case like this. So imagine that New York were so crowded that you couldn't even leave your apartment, like you were physically blocked. What would the rent be in New York? It would be very low because it would be a miserable place to live. You'd, yes, right. you'd basically be paying to be trapped in your apartment. So there is a point where congestion gets so bad that you would clearly see it in rents. And yet when we take a look at all the most, uh, most congested areas of the United States and the world, what we virtually always see is that those places are still really expensive, 
suggests to me that these uh, agglomeration is much more important than congestion, and congestion is more of an excuse that people throw out at the people that they don't like rather than a genuine drawback. Because, you know, think, if you're a misanthrope in New York City, you can move to Kansas. Yeah. You can get away from all the people, and you'll save a ton of money. Yeah. However, you'll wind up giving up all these choices that even if you don't like the people directly, you like the choices that the existence of people nearby provide for you. So let's go back to Portland for a minute. Are you suggesting mm-hmm. that the people of Portland uh, made a mis- make a mistake mm-hmm. when they limit growth opportunities there, or are you suggesting there's a public choice uh, rent-seeking explanation for why they pursue these policies? Well, see, I don't mean, so normally when, when we say public choice... And, and I'm talking to yeah. the author of The, the Myth yes. of the Rational Voter, who Brian's sure, a sure. skeptic about uh, the wisdom of public policy uh, mediated through democracy or even a republic. Right. So normally when we say public choice rent-seeking, we mean that there's some policies that are bad for the people living there, but good for some special interests. Yeah. I, I mean, in my general view, I mean, I'm not, I'm not married to this idea, but my general view is that special interests are a, are a pro-development force. So basically, special interests well, are, you know, special interests are the people who want to do something new, who are there saying, please let us do something new. Let us do something new. We want to do something new. And they have to bribe sometimes. Yeah, they, they bribe people way. or they just ask and ask and ask until finally someone gets elected who says yes. Right? I think without these special interests, uh, you know, probably very little development would happen. Right? So I think you know, what's really going on in Portland is that voters like this. I think voters are the people who like smart growth, right? And I, I mean, again, there's, there's existing clearly, existing yes, residents. Yes, existing residents. Existing. Well, that's, that's what voters are: existing yeah. residents. No doubt, there are some people, you know, you know, some special interests there who are trying to keep out development. But I think actually, probably, probably, I'm not sure, but probably, thinking that interest groups are, if anything, the reason why anything gets developed in Portland at all is that their interest groups pushing, right? And what I say is, look, in terms of, of their own financial interests, they are making a mistake. They make a mistake because, by, you know, development would actually raise the value, raise the value of the real estate. You let in, you wind up letting, you know, you, just, you let in a lot more construction, but it also makes it a better place to live. And an event, you basically are making Portland more, more like Manhattan. You may say, well, yeah, I mean, financially be better off, but personally be worse off because I like living in a small, relaxing area. Yeah, I don't, and, if I wanted and, to yes, live in Manhattan, I would. Yes, and here, and here, what I say is, well, when your when your real estate prices go through the roof, you have a lovely choice. You can either say, you know what. Actually, I, I actually I don't mind living in this high population area so much, and I really like having having this very expensive real estate, and that's great. Or you could go and say I'm going to sell, and I'm going to move to the vast majority of the United States that it, that that is more like Portland and less like Manhattan. So you yeah, go, and move, but, go and move to a yeah, suburb. That's a clever argument, yes. but but the, the fact is there there are there's a limited number of such places. There would be more of them if maybe yes. if there was more immigration. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a physical space. Right. Issue, so you, but so you go, you go and be... live in the go and live in the outskirts of Portland. You sell your very your your wildly expensive real estate there, and you go and have a nice life. You know, thirty minutes away. But they like being in the central city, and they like downtowns. Yeah. They have romance about them. Yes. Well, again, I, so I guess there I would there I go back to all right. Fine, we'll we'll let the growth in, and then not only will you get the real estate gain, we'll also well, how about this? We also will have an have an extra tax on the new entrant, saying that uh, we're going to compensate people who have owned their property here for more than a certain time. Which again, not that I favor it, but I think it's a lot better than just saying you can't have the growth at all. Okay, so we're we're almost out of time. I want to close with. Um a little bit of uh, imagination, which I think is really the essence of economics, is helping us to see things we wouldn't normally see. And what we've been doing today is a big thought experiment, really. We started with one where Brian uh, posed a dis- slightly discomforting, perhaps, example of being restricted from re-entering the United States. I want to pose a slightly different one to close, which is the point you made earlier about status quo bias. It, mm-hmm. I think it's very difficult for people... I think it's easier for economists because that's the way we're, we're, we've come to think or we like to think. But it's difficult for folks to imagine a radical policy change. And, and I think correctly, one of the great strengths of the United States is that radical policy changes are they're hard to get through because various checks or, and balances. Or used to be. Well, they used to be. Yeah, <laughs> it seems to be getting a little easier. We'll see. Um, but you know, we did live in a time once where we had something very close to open immigration. Mm-hmm. And people forget that you know they they, oh, yeah. they view this a proposal like Brian's as sort of uh, it's frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're worth uh, pointing out that within most countries in the EU, you now have open borders as well. Good point in the yes. European Union. Yes, in the European right. Union, which is not such a you know not so different from you know like 1900 America is much more different from us than we are from the modern EU. But let's go back to 1900 America though, and we and we mm-hmm. had because it's American which yes, I think is, is, is very is comforting right. to people. So, you know, when we had that time, it, it was a 
there were people who were very worried about it, just like oh, we're, sure. we're talking about it now. There was violence, it, blood, the blood in the streets. Yeah, it turned out, I think, pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, although it was followed by the progressive era, which, mm -hmm. which may have may lead some to conclude, worry although, more about the politics part. But Although, well, normally, the, the, the normal story there of almost every historian is that immigrants were the people the progressives were against. Okay, well, that's a comfort. <laughs> Uh, but but talk for a little bit about you know we've made a very rational set of arguments here uh, for and against immigration. Um, do you want to say anything else about drawing on that that we have a, a wonderful historical experiment? Do we have any thoughts that are there people who uh, think that it turned out horribly? Or and and the other question I'd have would be, is there any reason to think that that's comforting to mm -hmm. people who currently are worried about immigration? Yeah, I mean, and by the way, I just, one last thing I'm sorry is, which is, I think a common argument you hear when when you, when you make a point like that is, well, those were different people, you know, those yes. were people more like me. They were, they were Eastern European, say, and and today it's it's Latin American. That's different because they're not from Eastern Europe, <laughs> which you can't deny. I, I just think it's important to remind people that when they came from Eastern Europe. We heard the exact same things that we that we hear now about how they're not going to assimilate, they're not going to speak our language, they have high crime rates, they're going to ruin our jobs, etc. Didn't turn out that way, right? I mean, I mean, ob you know, obviously, I agree, and I think I think you're right that it's you won't find very many people who will say that uh, open immigration was a bad thing during that period of U.S. history. Right? What's striking to me is I think that if we had not had that immigration, people today would would look back and say it would have been crazy to do so. Right? And in fact, there's kind of an interesting comparison, which is Australia, which, uh, as far as I understand, had, had much stricter immigration, or much stricter immigration restrictions. So basically what they've got is something like 10% of America. We've got something like 10% of America. Again, I mean, partly it may you mean be in terms of population yeah, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of population, GDP. So yeah, yeah not, not per capita. But in terms of what's going on in Australia, it's something like 10% of what we have going on here. And I think that if that was all that we had, people today would say, what did we miss? What we missed is being 10 times as awesome. We yeah. missed 10 times as many people getting to enjoy the quality of life that we have here. We miss all of the inventions, all the ideas, all the creation, all, you know, all, you know like every, every dream of every person who ever wound up coming here was what we would have missed. And yet it is, you know, it is the classic kind of thing that Frederick Bastiat says that we don't see unless we have it. And I think that, you know, that a lot of what is really going on right now is that what, what, you know, what immigration restrictions do to people in other countries it's just not seen, and it's easy for people to blanket out of their minds. But when I really think about the immigrants that I know, and, you know, and I know many immigrants, so you know, immigrants are my, my friends, they are my neighbors, my wife is an immigrant. I mean, these are all human beings who all, if we, if we would really listen to the opponents of immigration, they wouldn't be here. Right? They wouldn't be allowed to be here. We would have said, well, let's err on the side of caution, not let them in. And because we didn't err on the side of caution, because we let them in, they are here and enjoying their lives, and these are, these are people I care about. I think these are these are people who are as worthy of our concern as people who happen to be born in this country. Or indeed, I will say, in in many ways, immigrants are more admirable when you look at the adversity that they've overcome and how much they man how much they manage to do with their lives when they're here. And their attitude is one that really Americans ought to learn from. My guest today has been Brian Kaplan. Brian, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.